Okay, it's 1.50, so I, let's get started. Thanks. This is a, we appreciate everyone who shows up on the last afternoon of the conference, <laughs> right after lunch. <laughs> it's the worst time slot to have. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, I, th uh, welcome to our talk about um, OpenStack Cinder. And uh, let me go ahead, we're gonna make, just make some introductions since there's three of us here on stage. So I'll start. Um, so my name is Ken Hoy. I am a Director of Product or Technical Marketing at uh, an OpenStack startup called Platform9. Uh, prior to that, I was at uh, EMC working on their OpenStack strategy. And uh, just before that, I was at Rackspace as the OpenStack evangelist. So John, you wanna go? Uh, my name is John Griffith. I'm a software engineer at uh, Solid Fire. I've been there for about four years. Um, we are a storage appliance company. We make flash storage, um, kind of built for OpenStack in our opinion. Uh, and mostly what I do actually is work on OpenStack as opposed to anything else. So. Uh, I am Arun, I uh, work at Platform9 as a as software engineer, uh, work on multiple components from Cinder, Nova, uh, Neutron. Previously I was with Cisco working on OpenStack. Great, thanks guys. All right, so um, we're gonna uh, tackle a few topics today. Uh, one is I'm gonna talk a little about what is OpenStack. Um, obviously, uh, one of the things I actually wanna do first is, uh, with the folks in the audience, how many of you are new to OpenStack? Uh, and by that I mean, how many of you are just learn have, only have been working on OpenStack or learning about OpenStack less than one year? Okay, so how about less? How about more than one year, but less than two? Okay. So most of you actually know OpenStack. Okay, so I'm not gonna go into great, that's fine. That means there's less details I need to go there. Um, although I will talk a little bit about it just for the benefit of folks who are new. Uh, how many of you have uh, deployed OpenStack Cinder with your OpenStack deployments? Okay, a lot less people. All right, so we're gonna, one of the things I'll do here, we'll, we'll talk a bit about what Cinder is um, and what are the use cases uh, that we find uh, it's two different companies that are working in some way of OpenStack. Uh, what are the good use cases for Cinder? And then we're gonna do a demo that talks, uh, that kind of shows you how uh, OpenStack and OpenStack Cinder works uh, and using uh, the uh, Platform 9's version of OpenStack uh, or implementation of OpenStack along with Solify as, the, uh, as an example of a, a good uh, Cinder backend. Okay, so let's start by talking about what is OpenStack. Again, I'm, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but uh, the thing that I wanna focus on here is uh, to, give you, to give you an understanding, or make sure it's very clear that what OpenStack isn't, right? So OpenStack itself isn't a hypervisor. It is not even a networking technology and it's not a storage technology, right? It is, in fact, an orchestration system, right, to manage uh, multiple resources, including storage, uh, that gives uh, end users the ability to provision their own resources on demand, right? So uh, if, a lot, if any of you have been in IT for a while, you might remember a, a time when if you needed some, uh, res some compute resources along with some storage, you had to file a, a ticket or send an email to an, an operator who then had to take anywhere from maybe a week to a few months, depending on what he had in inventory, in order to present those resources to you. Right. With uh, OpenStack, uh, by plugging in these various storage and compute and networking resources, you as an end user or developer can actually provision your own resources and do it in a matter of minutes instead of waiting weeks, months to do so. So that's, um, so, and, we're, and later I'm gonna talk a bit about how Cinder kind of fits into this picture of the orchestration platform. Then, so you know, see the spaghetti here? <laughs> so this is, the, the way OpenStack is architected is every, uh, all the services are kind of their own, um, essentially their own project that are kind of tied together through APIs. Um, and. There's a, number, there's a number of reasons for doing that, including the fact that it's, we think it will scale better. And Cinder happens to be one of those distributed projects that are part of this architecture. 
And the goal of OpenStack at the end of the day is actually quite simple in many ways. It's to give use, users and businesses the ability to deliver self-service IT, which we talked about earlier, and do it rapidly and at large scale. Right? So this, the idea here is, in the old days, when, again, when you had to request resources and wait months, weeks to get a resource, you could probably, let's say you could do 10 projects a year for, for some amount of money. And you hope three of them succeed while the, and to actually make you some money, right? What if you could, because now you can do your own resources, provision them yourself, now you can do 30 projects a year, right? At the same cost that it used to take you to do 10. Now, even if you, even if you uh, had a lower success rate, but because you can do many more projects at the same cost, you basically um, become more valuable to your company. So that's a very, it's a sort of example of why it's important uh, to have a, a cloud platform that lets you do self-service at rapid scale. Um, and there's different models for consuming OpenStack today. So uh, Rackspace, which is one of the companies that started the open source project, was interested in OpenStack as a way to create a public cloud that could compete directly with Amazon Web Services. Um, NASA, which is the other company, U.S. company that was involved in creating OpenStack, was interested in it to create a uh, private cloud one running in their own data center. So, that, so historically, those have been the two primary ways for OpenStack to be consumed, either as a public cloud or as a distribution. It's software you install your, and operate yourself. A third model that's emerging, uh, which Platform 9 uh, it specializes in, is this, um, it's to operate uh, OpenStack is a private cloud, but as a service, which means it run, in, we're managing data, uh, customer resources on site, but you, you as a customer don't actually manage OpenStack. That's outsourced to someone else, like Platform 9. Um, and this is from the OpenStack Marketplace webpage. This is an example of different companies. Some of them offer uh, diff, uh, more than one way of consuming OpenStack, but these are the three, broadly speaking, these are the three ways of consume OpenStack and the comp vendors that specialize in those ways of consumption. So, except for he XP Helion. Oh, like yes, that's right. Well, they're still around, so this is good until, until January. There. Until 2016. <laughs> Red Hat is spelled wrong. You're right. I don't know how this ha I'm going to blame spell check. <laughs> so let's talk a bit about... Uh, so, let's, so that's the broad scope of what OpenStack is and what's, how it's been, what it's been used for and who's providing OpenStack. I want to kind of zill in on Cinder and block storage in particular. Um, and uh, so John's going to help me here probably because he, is the, he, used, he helped actually start the OpenStack project. Um, actually, do you want to talk sure. about Cinder and yeah. what it is? Uh, so, for those that, that don't know, just kind of a quick background, um, it used to be, everything was basically in one project. Uh, it was, everything was under Nova, including block storage. Um, as things grew, started to scale, one of the things that we looked at a number of years ago was, hey, you know, block storage is kind of important to a lot of people, especially if they want to run databases and things like that. Um, we should probably take it out of Nova and give it some of its own focus. Um, so that's how we created Cinder. So we started that effort uh, about three and a half years ago. Um, it's been an official project and, and blessed and everything for two, two and a half years. Um, so it, it actually made a significant impact on OpenStack and the growth of OpenStack. Uh, because prior to that, um, storage was just kind of an afterthought. It was kind of a secondary thing. So. Uh, so that's, can, that's been a really big deal and a really big uh, push to get things kind of going forward. At the time, we had three vendors that had uh, plugins or drivers for, for OpenStack. And as of today, we have over 80. So yeah. it's definitely grown. So it's good and bad. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly bad, but... <laughs> so a couple of, thing, couple of things on this slide I think needs, uh, worth highlighting. Um, one is that in that second bullet point, um, there's a key word in there persistent. Uh, and that's what makes Cinder different than uh, the storage that was typically used when OpenStack was first uh, created, right? Uh, in, that, in those days, when you created a VM, it used something called ephemeral storage, uh, which typically was 
could be an NFS mount, but typically was storage that was inside of the hypervisor compute node. It was called ephemeral because the idea was if that VM got deleted, all the data was also deleted. Um, which for cloud native use cases actually is okay and may even be preferable, right? But what if you wanted a, what if you were running a database that and you need the data not to go away when the VM got deleted? That's where Sunda came in to do that. That's so that's um, one point. Second point is um, is a, a lot of you may come from a background where you're dealing with a lot of storage area networks, kind of enterprise storage arrays. And, and uh, when I talk to people who are from that background, they tend to think, they mistakenly think of Cinder as like a storage volume that they use, let's say, uh, with VMware, right? That where you can share that storage among different um, servers and resources. So it's very important to understand that Cinder is not shared storage. Right. The best way to think of Cinder actually is that it's a USB drive. Uh, it could be a really large USB drive, but it is essentially a USB drive that you can plug into a VM, right? But you can't plug that same USB drive into a second VM at the same time. So you, so you, you can delete that VM, the data stays, but then you have to detach it and reattach it to something else. It's Correct. just a local disk. It's a raw block right. device. Yep. Right. So that becomes, and that point I made is being important because uh, one of the reasons shared storage is very valuable in some use cases is it lets you do things like um, live migrations of, of VMs without having to move the data around, right? Or, uh, or do what they call HA, where you can, where when a, a computer node fails, you can restart everything on another. <laughs> And all the, since all the data is shared by, seen by all, all the servers, all the VMs can see everything too. That's not what Cinder is. <laughs> Cinder will not let you do that. And I f I'm bringing that up again because uh, enterprises make that mistake of thinking Cinder gives them shared storage. So, anyways. Um, so, you want to talk about this one here? Sure. Yeah, so um, the key is to, to build on this. What you end up with with Cinder is you now have basically disk devices or raw disk devices that you can dynamically create and plug in and unplug from your VMs. Um, so it takes the idea, you know, this Ken uses the analogy of the thumb drive. So that thumb drive basically looks like just a raw block device, just a raw disk. So you can create that, create whatever size you want. You can specify characteristics by using types, things like that. Um, and then you can attach it, mount it, format it, put your data on it. And that data could be databases, it could be the actual image, the boot image for the instance itself, so you can boot off of it. One of the things that people get a little hung up on on OpenStack is the concept of ephemeral instances. Um, some people love the fact that the instance is ephemeral and after you shut it down, everything is gone and you start over. Some people hate that. So what you can do is you can use a cinder volume and boot off of that. Now you have a persistent instance. Right, so that's that's a pretty powerful thing for a lot of people. Um, one of the things that you have to kind of keep in mind is, you know, we're not object store, and as Ken said, we're not a shared file system. We're a block storage. So, what does that mean? That means things that have a high change rate, uh, things that have I/O demands. So, things like databases, things like boot partitions, things like that. That's the sort of thing that you want to run on a Cinder volume. Uh, Things like storing images or music or photos, you know, whatever it might be, that's the perfect thing to use something like Swift or an object store for. Right? So those are some of the big differences. Um, the other thing is, you know, a lot of people have a, a background with AWS these days for obvious reasons. Um, one of the easiest ways to figure out Cinder is look at AWS and what EBS is, because most things in OpenStack are actually modeled off of AWS, um, and Cinder is no exception to that. So, the difference uh, with OpenStack is, you know, then just throwing in more disks is everything's automated and it's scaled. And in theory, you have kind of an infinite pool of resources, right? So as you start to consume resources and you're getting close to running out, you can bring in more storage more backends, plug them in, and continue to grow and keep expanding that and have the 
you know, appearance of an infinite pool of resources. And that's the whole idea of OpenStack. You continue to scale horizontally. As you reach capacity, you can always continue to scale out and keep going. So there was, uh, there's been a number of talks about this this week. Um, if you went to the keynotes on the first day, uh, the COO from Bitnami gave some great uh, examples and, and talked about, you know, things like why cloud matters, why OpenStack deployments for private cloud matter and why they're important. Um, you know, the, 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 the basic thing is really is um, if you do software development and you have development happening in-house, um, things like OpenStack and a private cloud are going to be a huge asset to you. Because the point is, is they make everybody, they give everybody the capability to move faster, right? Um, one of the things that software developers always have traditionally had problems with is getting resources to do their job. And those resources could be servers, storage, networking, right? So you have all these great ideas, um, all this code you want to write, all these different things that are going on, but you need resources to do that. And back to the point made earlier, in a traditional environment, if you're using just bare metal and stuff like that, you may have to file requests, submit tickets, and takes weeks, days, months, whatever, but it takes an extended period of time to get that. And you're also limited in what you can get anyway. So if we go to the next slide, um, if you look, so there's a development process and it goes something like this, right? So you're creating an app and you're going to use a Mongo database in it um, and you're going to run this on CentOS and you're going to do all these cool things and it's going to be awesome. Um, but you need to prove out some ideas. You have some concepts you need to figure out and, and see if your, some of your code's going to work and stuff. Um, and in order to do that, you're going to need, you know, a Linux box for a day or so uh, that you can put MongoDB on. And you're going to need four network cards on it, say, and, you know, some other things. So, you know, you're not exactly sure. I don't know exactly how much memory I'm going to need on that box. I don't know exactly how much storage or what kind of performance it's going to need or anything else. Um, I may actually not want to do this on CentOS. I might want to do it on something else, or I might want to do it on both. Um, I should probably compare those things and benchmark them. So the first thing you do is you try and guess, right? You try and guess what you're going to need, because you're going to have to fill out a request form. Um, so you're always going to guess on the higher side and overestimate. Um, and then you're going to submit that request to IT, and then you're going to wait. Um, and that waiting could be, again, days, weeks, whatever it might be in your organization, depending on what the resources are. And the best part, and I've had this happen to me, I'll submit a request and say, hey, I need a Linux box, you know, with this storage, blah, blah, blah. And they come back after a week and say, yeah, we didn't have a Linux server, but here's a Windows box. It's the same thing, right? <laughs> so um, those of you that do any development know that's very far from the truth. So, um, so anyway, that doesn't work. Uh, is the bottom line. So now, <laughs> that's how you feel. You're not very happy. Um, so now you get things like an OpenStack cloud and you have something like Platform 9 uh, and SolidFire and you have that in-house. It's significantly different, right? Because now what happens is developers have quota, right? So IT can set up or whoever can set up and say, hey, you're allowed this many resources, this is your pool, do whatever you want. Um, you know, it's up to you to manage that and figure it out and make your priorities and set those things up. So now what I can do is I can go ahead, just spin up an instance on demand, it takes a few seconds, um, load my software, hack it some code, work on it for a bit, and then I might sit there and I say, hey, you know what, the storage that I have and attached to this, um, you know, it's, it's okay, but I wonder what would happen if I had a faster disk. So you can do things like retype that volume that you already have and say retype it to a higher IOPS level, increase the performance on it, and run another set of tests, right? So then you do that, you look at it, and hey, that's even better. So you keep going through these things, and then you think, well, this little design that I have with Mongo and all these things that I'm doing, um, I think I could actually do this with MySQL and just go back to a, a relational database and, you know, this will all still work. So you can go ahead and just blow it all away and start over. And you can do all this on the fly, dynamically on your own, no requests, no waiting, nothing. Um, you do that, hack at it some more, and then you think, hey, 
this is better, let me tweak it, mess with it. Now let me spin up a couple of more and test it in some other platforms and so on and so forth. So you're doing all of these things in the same amount of time that you would have probably waited to get that one server from your initial IT request in the past, right? And as people have pointed out before, one of the things that's showing enterprises that there's a real demand for private cloud is the fact that their developers are doing shadow cloud anyway. They're going to Amazon, they're going to Rackspace, they're going to Google, they're going to all these places because they don't want to wait, they don't want to deal with this pain, they just want to do their job and you know, have fun, right? Most of us that write software think it's fun. So they just want to do that and get it done. So they just use their own credit card and they go out and they do it in the public cloud anyway. So. So as I said, you know, in the time that you would have waited for the resources to come from IT, we're able to test an initial design, test it in multiple configurations, hack on it, try a new design in parallel. We, comp we finish the application, we test it on all these platforms. We probably have a continuous integration system set up that's running in a cloud, right? We have all these things. And you release an app and make billions of dollars. <coughs> We all want to do. And that's how you feel. This, this one's much better if it's animated, but it's not. So, <laughs> all right. um, so we're going to talk a little bit about Platform 9 Sci-Fi in, in the context of it as being kind of example implementations of using OpenStack with a Slender backend. Um, before I do that, though, I wanted to see, does anyone have any questions? Because I kind of blasted through a bunch of material. Um, just want to see if there's a question out there. Yeah, go ahead. This is all nice and good, but what happens to the apps after the deployment? Um, it's nice to be able to get VMs quickly and Cinder volumes and stuff so we can get stuff done. Um, developers tend to forget about these, so they kind of pile up and idle around. Is there a way to automatically purge disk images of VMs after a given time? So the, you want me to so there's a couple of different thoughts on that. Um, and you know, here's one thing right now is that's what quotas are for. So you're given a quota, and as an engineer and as a developer, it's up to you to manage what you do with that. If you wanna just sit on it and camp on it, that's your business, right? Um, there are things that are being proposed and, and some people are starting to implement where they do things like auto-delete. Um, so you can do that, uh, externally anyway, you can set up tools uh, and scripts and monitors and stuff that will do that. Um, or there is some talk and, and thought about actually putting those sorts of things inside of OpenStack proper today. So yes. Okay, good, thanks. Anyone else? Questions? No? All right, if not, uh, like I said, I'm just, we're gonna talk quickly about what Platform 9 and Solidify is to set some content, kind of set the table for the demo that we're gonna do to show a uh, sender of OpenStack. Uh, so I will, um, so P Platform 9 does what we call managed OpenStack. So the way to think about it, it's, it's actually quite simple, is uh, instead of having our customers deploy and operate open the OpenStack controllers, we actually do that for, th uh, for them, but not in their data center, but in our cloud. And then we, c but then we connect to a customer's data center and manage their hypervisors and their storage and networking. So it's, a, it's basically a split model where customers uh, have their concerns or as operators, they're only concerned about their current infrastructure. Platform 9 uh, focus on running OpenStack and then the uh, developers get self-service. Right, so uh, it helps to kind of get OpenStack up running a lot faster because a lot of times customers don't have expertise in running OpenStack. Can I ask just a real quick question? Yeah. Um, does that mean the control plane is off premises? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, so, beca um, so because of that, we've got some um, a typical customer uh, has, will usually get our, uh, have OpenStack up and running for the developers in about 15 minutes. But so things like streaming glance images goes through the control plane. No, so there's some things, okay. things that are latency sensitive will, will house in the customer's environment. Uh, the other key thing is we can actually discover existing environments. So if a, if you, as a, if a customer has, you know, 100 hypervisors and 10,000 VMs um, and they want to make that a self-service cloud, 
we, run, we can actually discover all the VMs and all the resources that are running and import it into OpenStack. So they, that's why you can go, kind of go from zero to OpenStack in about 15 minutes. So I'm going to say <laughs> about that. Uh, so the key benefits, again, is because customers don't worry about OpenStack, uh, we do. Uh, they can continue using their tools, continue the, the same um, you know, process they followed in order to manage their infrastructure. Uh, so I, what I like to say is if Platform 9 does their job right, uh, oddly enough, customers don't even know they have OpenStack running. They just know they have their infrastructure and their developers get self-service. And uh, John, you want to talk a bit about SolidFire? Yep. So from the, the SolidFire side, we actually started a, a number of years ago. Uh, our, our founder was actually working on OpenStack. Um, and one of the things that he was trying to do was find a storage solution to use in OpenStack that would work well. Um, and at the time, there really wasn't anything that worked well. So he decided he had this brilliant idea to go off and build something. And that's what we came up with with SolidFire. Um, the, the differentiator for us is we're focused on automation. So everything on our cluster is intended to be fully automated. And we're also focused on dividing the resources on the cluster into two pools. So you have a pool of capacity and you have a pool of performance. And the idea is that you can go ahead and select items and provision from those pools completely independently. So the beauty of it is you can plug that into something like Cinder and into OpenStack, and you now have the ability to do all of those things the way OpenStack kind of intended and the way it kind of works with OpenStack, if that makes sense. Um, you know, we've, we've had full integration with, with OpenStack for a number of years. Um, we offer things like the ability to set and maintain quality of service, guaranteed quality of service levels using a minimum and maximum uh, IOPS settings. Um, we have built-in deduplication and compression. And of course, you know, we have all the regular table stakes, you know, snapshots and clones, uh, things like that. Um, a web-based API if you want to use it, but honestly, if you're integrating with OpenStack, you won't need it. Um, you know, we have a JSON RPC API that lets you do everything on the cluster that you could, that you would ever be able to do. So. All right, so I'm actually going to use this as a diagram. As like, so the example of how Cinder gets deployed. Um, again, obviously we have a slightly different model because we host the control services off-site. But whether it's off-site or on-site, um, the model, the implementation model itself, uh, or the, the components that make up Cinder is the same, right? So that is essentially going to be uh, some set of API services and scheduling services that run on the OpenStack controllers. And then there is a what we call a volume service. That is actually what presents a volume to your compute nodes. That volume service sits uh, in your environment somewhere and will and talks to whatever the backend storage it is. That backend storage could be just a bunch of a server with a bunch of disk on it, or it could be an enterprise storage array like like a Solify array or others. And basically. Uh, what as an end user, what you're doing is you're actually talking to the API service, which runs in the control. In this case, runs on our controllers, uh, which for Platform Nine happens to be offsite. But then it the uh, but then it, all the all the work of creating volumes and then having getting them attached are uh, done locally at the in, uh, at data in the customer data center use it through the volume service, which in this case is housed in this thing we call the uh, the volume node. So the volume node is basically a VM that runs a uh, vo the Cinder volume service. So, all right. So um, what? So Arne's going to come and he's going to just yes. demo kind of how you would uh, use OpenStack to connect to Solidify as a Cinder backend. Yep. Thanks, Ken. Let me get out. There you go. So I, uh, well, I get this up. So um, if you guys have played the OpenStack, you'll see that this is not the same dashboard as Horizon. Um, so the interesting thing is, although it's starting to change, is when OpenStack first came out and you looked at the documentation, the documentation said, basically said, Horizon isn't designed for use in production. <laughs> it was designed to be a reference implementation with the hope that people would actually design their own web interface that would 
um, that would be more production quality. I think that's starting to change now because so many people decide they're going to use Horizon for production that there's some pressure now to actually make it better. And they, I think they have. In our case, because of the way uh, some of the things he wanted to do, we actually create our own dashboard. Um, but the key thing here is um, underneath the covers, we are talking to the OpenStack APIs. I think the, in the exact same way that a Horizon dashboard is talking to the OpenStack APIs. Yep, so what you can see here is, like Ken said, the platform and controller. Um, and what I have opened here is the infrastructure page. So basically, whatever servers you have, hosts, uh, get listed here. Uh, and what we do here is uh, to enable Cinder in the back end. We have something called authorization, but uh, all you need to know is uh, this particular hypervisor uh, gets a Cinder back end. So what that means in OpenStack terms is Cinder volume service is going to be running there. And to do that, all you have to do is just enable it here and select various backends. Uh, so for one is SolidFire. Uh, all you need to do is uh, provide credentials and connection string parameters, which goes in a config file in your host, which you need SolidFire with. Yeah. So I will say this, this piece where we're configuring, authorizing the SolidFire rate, it's one of the reasons we end up using our own dashboard instead of Horizon. Uh, because you wouldn't be able to do this in the Horizon dashboard. You would have to do it through a command line. So we've enabled you to do this in our, in our kind of uh, Horizon replacement. Yep. And what you see here is the volumes page. It's similar to Horizon, as you can see. So I'll go ahead and create a volume. Uh, you, you have a couple of options with which you can create a volume. One is from a snapshot that you have already taken. The other is you can create a volume from another volume. Uh, another cinder volume, I mean, or you can create a volume from an image. So, uh, as OpenStack developer, or as I, I always like to use a Cirrus image, it comes by default. And what you can see here is it's uh, Cirrus image is a bootable image. So when I create a volume out of this, whatever. So I'm just creating a volume from an image. So what that means is internally uh, OpenStack Glance is going to, uh, Cinder is going to call Glance API to fetch the image. Once it's downloaded, it's going to create a volume out of it. And this particular volume, uh, as you can see, it says downloading, which means it's downloading the image from Cinder. Okay, it's done. So what this means is Cinder has already created a volume for you uh, with Cirrus image as source. And you can see that it's marked bootable here. And the reason because of is it's the image that you used is bootable. One other thing that you can see is the UUID that gets specified here. And John can probably iterate as well. So if you go to the SolidFire UI, yep. and so just refreshing it, and if I search for it. If you can find the last page. It yeah. should <laughs> be there in the last there page. There it is. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that we do on the SolidFire cluster, um, SolidFire has multi-tenancy uh, capabilities built into it. So what we do is we actually, for each tenant you have in your OpenStack cloud, we actually dynamically, through the driver, create an equivalent tenant using the same UUID on the SolidFire cluster. And then when you create volumes, Cinder uses a UUID to assign to, e to each volume. And we use that same UUID to name the volume on the SolidFire cluster. So now you have a one-to-one -one mapping for both tenants as well as volume IDs. Um, and actually, in large clouds, it actually turns out to be a pretty significant uh, thing. Um, for example, if you have a customer that goes away and doesn't pay, <laughs> it gives you a really easy way to figure out how to go through your, your backend storage and comb through and figure yeah. out what resources belong where. So yep. Uh, so, yeah. Before go, just so, because um, it kind of might be hard because we kind of go through this a little bit fast. So, there's a couple of different types of storage. I like the idea of creating a USB drive. <laughs> there's a couple of different types of Cinder US slash USB drives, right? One, um, one could just be an empty, essentially an empty volume. So, you might have a, a VM running somewhere and you just need some extra disk that you want to store some data on or a database. You can essentially create an empty volume quote unquote, plug that into that VM and say, start writing data to that disk. Um, that's uh, a typical way of doing things. 
Uh, this other way that what Aaron was demonstrating is instead of just creating an empty volume, you actually create a volume that has a disk image on it. And then you can actually spoot up a new VM using that disk image. So in that case, the disk, that cinder now is acting as the root, root disk uh, instead of just a you know, second volume that it, you attach. Yep. So what I did right now was uh, create an instance out of the volume that I had created, the bootable volume. So if you had seen what I was doing when Ken was talking was that. Just created a, vol uh, a VM and pointed the volume to be used as the base disk. So basically, instead of using the ephemeral disk for the VM now, we are going to be using the volume itself. And yeah, I'm waiting for it to come up. So what I wanted to show you was if I write something into this volume and then detach it from this VM and attach it to another VM, you still see the data in there. Do you, guys, well, you guys want to talk about why you would want to use Cinder as a bootable volume as opposed to yeah. just continuing to use ephemeral? For sure. What's yeah. the advantages? So uh, there's, there's a number of schools of thought, right? And I, I call it baked versus fried. Um, baked is the situation where you take a volume, like a bootable volume, and you put some preloaded image with a bunch of data on it. Right? As, opposed to, as opposed to the other method, which is fried, which means, hey, I'm going to spin up this ephemeral instance and I'm going to load everything onto it that I want dynamically when I need it. Well, what gets interesting is when you start doing things like CI, uh, continuous integration, or automated testing and things like that. So we have quite a few customers that use uh, a concept where they spin up thousands of VMs or thousands of instances that have significant... Um, you know, sized images that they use, like 500, 600 gig worth of data on them, right? So you don't want to populate that every single time you want to run your tests, right? So what they do is they'll go ahead and they'll just have one copy of this with a golden image or a master image, and they'll clone that thousands of times. Um, so what you can end up with is a test harness of thousands of machines all booted up, spun up, ready to go, and interacting with each other in a matter of minutes as opposed to some cases where they used to do it the old way, it would literally take them 72 hours to spin up this harness. They can now spin up that exact same harness in a matter of 12 to 15 minutes. So I, I, will, I will take the other side on this a little bit in that, in that there are some people who would say that is, um, the, the pro, uh, that that's a, not the approach that we want to take because they would say, uh, if I do that, then I'm using this shared storage system. The more st more shared storage I use, the less I can scale. And what they would say is, uh, if you're running cloud native applications, you're a fool if you have 600 gig <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of anything. Yeah, it's true. Right? They would say the, 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 uh, to make cloud native work, what you want is small instances of very small disk, but just uh, hundreds and thousands of them instead of tens and tens of and hundreds. Does that make sense? So it's, it's so my point is it's, I'm not trying to say one, uh, one use case is more valid than the other. Uh, my point is there are two, um, that there are different use cases and it's very important if you guys are, particularly if you guys are gonna be ones who are architecting your, uh, your OpenStack cloud, that you choose the right architecture and make the right design decisions for what it is that, for the workload that you're trying to support. Right? If your workload doesn't, it's going to be a lot of small instances, um, then you may not need to boot off this. But if you're going to use 600 gig volumes and boot off a lot of them, then you probably need to have Cinder somewhere in the back end. So again, think K carefully. Um, I'm a, you know, we're vendors up here, but I will tell you, don't just listen to your vendors. <laughs> you know, <laughs> unless it's me. <laughs> right. I, you know, if you're an architect, you you have a responsibility to understand what your use case is and what is the right solution for your use case. Yeah, so what I just did here is deleted that VM that I booted up through the volume. And so now I can use that volume on a different VM. So I attach it to another VM and you can see that the file that I had written there was already here present. So I can do some more fun stuff as like snapshotting a VM. Uh, so an, an interesting thing is if you snapshot a VM uh, with a volume attached to it, you are, you are going to get a snapshot of the volume as well. And you can create a new volume from that snapshot. It's like inception of volumes to volumes to volumes. <laughs> you can do that. And uh, just to uh, just for you guys to know that, it's, so I'm going to show you 
a dev stack with Horizon UI. It, it, it's just a different UI that we are using in Platform 9. But everything but else, yeah. Do the same thing with <laughs> those volumes, so. Yeah. Um, so, and by the way, what Aaron just demonstrated is actually one use case. Another use case for Cinder is you, you saw that because it was using Cinder. If the compute node died that housed that VM, if you had ephemeral disk, um, basically you lose everything and you have to rebuild everything, right? In his case, if everything was sitting on a Cinder volume, but even if the compute node went away, you could basically just uh, spin up new VMs and reattach to those volumes and get things up running very quickly. So a, it, it, it can be useful as a way to do very rapid recovery uh, in the event of some kind of failure. So one example of that um, to touch on and back to mm -hmm. the other thing we talked about. Um, I do, I have a number of things that I do that has a test database that I have, right? So I have a, t a database that is populated with all kinds of random test data. Um, and I will test that in multiple configurations in parallel. And the way I do that is exactly like Ken is saying. I boot up an instance and I attach that volume and I run my automation on it and it does that testing for me. Um, I always come back to the cloning thing. I use that a lot. Some people use it, some people don't. But for me it works well because I can run all sorts of tests in parallel now. I don't have to wait and do them sequentially. Um, so. Yep. So this is the Horizon dashboard and I can go ahead and create a volume here and you can see it on platform and it's interchangeable using the same database and backend. Uh, new volume from Horizon. And this is using solid fire, right? As yeah, the backend this is using solid still. fire. Mm -hmm. So what I can do is I can create a raw volume, but I created a volume type, which probably John can talk about uh, as a bronze. So it's got some QoS settings for solid fire specific stuff and Say create volume. There you go. You have a new volume, and I think platform manager should also see that. Yep. All right. So this is the being able to discover stuff. So so again, the key is that the, 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 the two different dashboards work pretty much the same. Uh, the main difference being the platform nine dashboard has the ability to also configure the storage array. Um, which isn't available in currently in the Horizon dashboard. Till we push it into Cinder. Unless and we, un <laughs> until we give this away and say, and if people want it. <laughs> so. And we do. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, so if you have questions, uh, could you come on up or find the guy running around the mic? <laughs> um, so um, are you using metadata with Cinder anywhere there? Oh, uh, we use metadata in lots of places. It depends on where you mean exactly. So when you were creating that volume, uh, that volume type, and you said there were certain QO, QoS that uh, is metadata characteristics. That's exactly yeah. what that is. Okay. So the way the volume types work, um, you create so an administrator can create a volume type, and he or she can assign what we call extra specs to that volume type. Those extra specs are just key value pairs. They're right. just metadata. So when you were going through your own interface, were you actually passing the metadata directly there instead of through a volume type? Uh, no, it, it, goes, it goes through the interface. Or it, I mean, it goes through the volume type. What happens is the driver, the OpenStack driver, it actually interrogates the information as it comes in and looks and says, hey, do I have a volume type associated with this? If yes, then does it have some specific QoS settings that I need to use? And if yes, then it sets those for you. I so see. it's all automated. For the snapshots, do you have any issue with getting transactionally consistent snapshots if you're using a database? So it, that's definitely something that you have to consider. Um, and that's why you start having to consider using things like um, you know, some of the Oracle tools or the MySQL right. tools that go along with that. Right. So um, or if you're doing cloud native, yeah, the whole you idea of consistency, <laughs> you don't need it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so at least that level of consistency, right? So again, it depends on the use case. So the, the, honestly, the, the answer in, in the direction we've tried to push people for the most years is stop doing it that way and quit, quit worrying about consistency. And do cloud native, <laughs> yep. basically, right? So um, we're kind of losing that battle lately, unfortunately. Um, but it, it's actually a much better way to go for you and everybody else involved. <laughs> I see. So. Um, 
is there a way that I can get something like a thin disk here, or do I care? You know, would you prefer that I create lots of small disks rather than, you know, a, a large disk and have it thin provisioned? So um, depending on the back end you use, that's really a don't care. Um, so in the case of SolidFire, um, and even actually in the case of LVM now is the default, um, most back ends are doing thin provisioning for you. Um, so it's a, it's a don't care. Yeah, so that's actually one a larger point that's worth bringing up is, uh, one of the things that Cinder has tried to do now is, uh, if you're if you guys are using different vendors arrays, not just SolidFire, but you know EMC, Pure, NetApp, whatever, yeah. all those arrays have obviously specific capabilities. Um, uh, so some of those cap many of those capabilities can be exposed through Cinder, so that uh, depending on which array you have, you can have different capabilities of that for that Cinder volume. That's what I call the magic of volume types. Because right. you can put anything you want in there. <laughs> right. So. All right. Um, what time is it? Uh, we are past time. I'm okay. Um, so thank you. Uh, if you have questions, you can always come up. We're, we're happy to try to talk to you uh, in the back or in the front here. But uh, everyone else, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it.